Today we're going to be talking about steering and suspension diagnostics and we'll start the conversation by just talking a little bit about you know what the traditional systems were in the past. We, we had our hydraulic assist you know and some of the things that we we saw in the collision world right it's you know it, it was looking at that tire wear and you would feel everything in the steering wheel if you went for a ride and that that alignment was off you would feel it it would be tugging on the wheel or you know you would have torque steer or whatever you might have right so you know now if we look at articles or things that we have on RTS currently that talks a little bit about steering and suspension why don't we start there so you know one of the first things that uh, we have on the website it doesn't matter how advanced the system is it all goes down to that foundation of is the structure right is the suspension component you know is there something bent um, if you don't start there you're going to wind up where you might be able to get the alignment to be all green and everything looks good on the alignment but for some reason unknown to you the vehicle keeps chewing up tires and the only indication is usually that somebody didn't three-dimensionally measure the vehicle and something's not right and the, all the steering angles are, are messed up from what it's supposed to be. So, so somebody perhaps got the alignment into the green, if you will, mm -hmm. despite the fact that there was still something not right underlying. Yeah. Right? And that's, uh, unfortunately, that does happen now and then. And that's where, was, I, for me, you really have to ask yourself the question whenever you're doing an alignment, why am I making this adjustment? Mm -hmm. And what potentially is it hiding or masking? And I think that's one of the things that, you know, mechanical shops might not necessarily understand because they're used to, okay, I have to adjust the tie rod and I have to adjust this position. There's procedures around it. But if the strut tower is not in the correct position, nothing else will be in the correct position. So that's where, um, you know, a lot of times when we get questions on that, we kind of direct people to start at those basic things. Is the structure actually right? Was there previous damage that you didn't know about? Um, you might be doing something where um, maybe you did a rocker and, and had a wheel that got hit, but if there was previous frame damage and that front lower rail isn't right, well, now you're trying to fix something that's already been previously damaged. So the basic fundamentals is oftentimes where you have to start with anything steering suspension, no matter if it's your basic hydraulic system or the most advanced uh, ADAS controlled uh, system out there that's raising and lowering the suspension depending on speed. So. Um, that's one of the kind of the main questions that we'll get on RTS is, you know, we got a car in, it's eating tires. Well, did you check this? Did you check the structure? First place, and a lot of times that's where they end up finding the damage. Um, one of the other things that we have um, on the website is we have a lot of different position statements, and we have a good one here um, from Mercedes-Benz where they actually um, call out if, you have suspension damage and like the tie rod end is bent, they want you replacing that steering gear because of all the electronic controlled um, components and they go into pretty good detail on it. But there's really, again, that fundamental, if there's something wrong with one part in suspension, it affects everything else within that system. Yeah. So we start thinking about some of the newer systems, right? In the days gone by, it was, you know, you saw those cars going down the road and they're rear of the car was over here and the front of the car was over there and it was still going down the street and you know you could feel that you could feel everything in the steering now we have all these electronic systems that compensate for some of the things that you find in these systems right yes so maybe it's let's talk a little bit about the the new electronic suspension and steering and some of the things that uh, shops ought to be looking for well the big pivot point year here in the united states was 2011. that's where most car manufacturers start introducing and implementing electronic control power steering. So going from hydraulic, which you mentioned already, and which gives you also a good feel uh, on the steering wheel during the vehicle's dynamics and motion, is that we now have an electrical motor on it and a, a couple of sensors, and they're talking to the computer, and the computer is commanding that electrical motor and assisting us with power steering. And uh, like you were mentioning, we're talking about diagnostics today. Of course, on the old systems, we have a visual diagnostics, inspecting it, feeling, seeing the pivot points. Are we having a heavy point in our suspension or in our chassis? Uh, that is a good one as well, but we also have the electronics now talking to us through our scanner or our laptop. And uh, we brought a couple of examples today to uh, bring this to uh, the attention of the public um, because the computer itself is also doing diagnostics. It's self-monitoring 
and if something falls outside of its parameters, that's when it gives us a fault code. But many, many times we have these issues like tire wear or drivability issues in our sh related to our chassis components that won't generate a fault code. And then we need to look into these parameters and interpret these parameters. So in many cases, with, with vehicles that come into a collision shop, um, the, the major damage, broken parts and things like that are no-brainers for us. We, we see those things, we see that part blatantly bent or damaged. Uh, a lot of the challenge comes in sometimes whenever it's very, very subtle. If it's something where a steering arm got bent just a little bit or a ball joint got damaged just a little bit. And that becomes something that, unless you've got a very critical eye uh, as you're looking these things over, you may not detect. And uh, you've, got a, you've got an example of a ball joint, and I think most of our viewers are familiar with them. But uh, tell us a little bit more about some of the differences of, right. of ball joints out so there. In the industry, we call this a low friction or low drag ball joint. Okay. Ball joints were invented and there were a steel ball joint sitting in a steel cap and then we have a zerk fitting or a grease fitting and we're greasing the ball joint, hopefully separating the steel ball from the chamber and lubricating it. Now, since we have the electronification of the chassis with all these sensors on it, we want to have a consistency in the friction coefficient of this ball joint and the other chassis components. How do we do this? We wrap this ball with a Teflon cap. Teflon is a synthetic material and it's actually a great lower than Kevlar. Now, what cool parts can we manufacture with Kevlar? Very impact resistant, bulletproof vests, right? Now, Teflon is not bulletproof, but it's impact resistant enough to carry the vehicle under its dynamics. The other thing that is cool about Teflon is that we can make it into a very smooth finish. By making it into a very smooth finish and then separating the steel ball from the chamber here, we all of a sudden have a consistency in friction and in drag of the movement of the ball joint. One self-inflicted wound that this industry is currently uh, experiencing with these electromechanical racks is that this technology goes hand in hand with the electromechanical power steering. If you're going to change this ball joint with an old school ball joint, which retrofits on that vehicle, that friction coefficient of that steel to steel ball joint will not be consistent. So putting a part in that doesn't meet OEM specifications. Correct. Now, that is not on your test drive after the car came out of the spray paint booth and all of a sudden the right side of the vehicle was equipped with a steel to steel ball joint versus the OE spec. Inside the power steering, there is a counter measuring turning friction at a certain speed and a certain steering angle. And if it sees a difference 50 or 70 times after each other, it will pop a fault code saying the driver, I got a friction problem inside the rack, interpreting that and saying, I got an inside problem, but it's actually originating from outside. People are changing very expensive electromechanical racks just by not knowing and mixing and matching old school technology so, with new school So technology. whenever we end up with a situation where potentially an electronic power steering system flags a code, we need to first eliminate everything external from that rack from the equation. Cool. And I was going through uh, some of the diagnostic flow charts on one vehicle manufacturer's service information, and it was very interesting the path they took you on because essentially, once that code was flagged, they then had you, had you separate the tie rod ends. And then they wanted to have you retest the system, look at some of the live data like we've got on the laptop here, mm -hmm. and then make your judgment, okay, is there a problem with the rack now? Yes. The next step they would take you on to was actually disconnecting the column from it on the other side, if, if that first step didn't fix the problem. Now, obviously, at that point, they wanted you to then take and inspect the suspension components very thoroughly and then look at the turning torque of the knuckles and things like that from side to side. And I guess whenever we think about a ball joint, I've seen situations where upper strut tower mounts started to hang up and bind. And ultimately that, I think, plays into the equation as well. Yep. So, so there, was, there was a conversation we were having yesterday afternoon and you showed me a video oh. on these ball joints. Yes. And 
initially my thought was we we don't want to show that video and no. I still don't know that we need to show the video no. but <laughs> I think it's wow. worth talking about yeah because absolutely. there there are in days gone by again it's not uncommon that you have a problem getting that ball drain out and people are using a torch to heat these things up to help get them out. That, that never crossed my mind to use a torch. I don't know, I was taught from day one, never heat suspension I've, parts. I've never done it either, <laughs> but I've seen it done. Well, I, I think what we saw yesterday yes. was wow. heat turned yes. one of these newer style ball drains into a missile. Yes, I, I think you have a very good point here. And here at ICAR, I think safety in our trainings is priority number one, that people do a, a safe repair and, and bring the vehicle back into safety, well, and back keep on the, the road. Safe. So if, 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 for instance, this... Being a sealed ball joint, a, that's the key. No a, seal, fitting, a, seal, a sealed no ball relief. joint, yes. And then, and then due to rust or corrosion or whatever, and uh, the, the, the nut is stuck on the thread, Many people take the, how do you call that, the blowtorch, right? Yeah, they're and taking heat, the torch. And he, and he or maybe they can't get the ball joint out of the lower control arm, and they're heating the whole lower control arm assembly, yes. which is also taboo. So <laughs> I heard two stories in the industry going around and, and, and working with uh, low friction ball joints. First of all, you heat it up and you melt the Teflon cap. Now all of a sudden you, you wrecked a good quality ball joint. Now you need to purchase a new ball joint many, many times. These are ball joints that are not replaceable, but c come as one part completely with the wishbone. So the cost, it's not very cost right. effective and say, okay, I'm gonna get a $25 ball joint and press that in. Second of all, when you heat this up, you get this kind of melting and it's so compressed and compact inside that you actually have an exploding part and this comes out of that socket like a bullet out of the barrel. Now I had college teachers calling me up and say, hey Neil, my students put one in a vice grip and heated it up with the blowtorch and that ball joint is still sticking in their wall at the college because it's too high to grab it out and pull yeah, it out of the wall. There's a few different videos out there on it. It's like a 12 gauge yeah. shotgun yes. going off. Yes. It's yes. impressive. The, Don't the do it. The lesson there is, see, uh, I know none of us have ever used heat for anything like that. Doesn't matter how old the car was. But the, the lesson there is, if you're thinking about using heat on these ball joints, think again. No, uh, that's, uh, don't think, just don't do it. That's, that's the lesson here. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so if we're gonna dive in and start talking about some of this information you're finding in, the, in there, I think you looked at a couple of vehicles here in the shop. Yes, we did. Examples. Yep, so um, I'm gonna have them come over to the computer screen and sitting right next to me. And what I have on the computer screen is some of the live data. And I'm gonna try to get it uh, situated so I've got the right part of the live data showing here. And if I do this right, there we go. I'll get it framed up just right, right there. So uh, essentially, and I made the mouse plenty big. I think a little this, bit to the this, left. This, so. uh, this, this top line right here is amperage. And uh, as I turn the steering wheel, and I'm pretty close to full lock, but uh, it's drawing a very low amperage, what I have to do is I have to take the cursor down here and move it across so I can draw that line across. You'll find that uh, as I come across there, the amperage, uh, Neil wants me to get the amperage number, so as the amperage starts to ramp up, as I start to come across some friction, uh, that amperage is sitting there at one amp, and as I start to turn the wheel and come across, um, I'm drawing about 48 amps. It actually peaks out at about 142 amps right here as I come against the full lock on the steering wheel. 142 amps. 142 amps. So if I'm welding at 142 amps, I'm welding something uh, better than an eighth of an inch thick. Uh, probably three sixteenths or something like that in steel. Yeah. When I run at 142 amps, it's a, it's a lot of current. Well, uh, I calculated it on 13.6 volts, and we're around 1,700 watts that this thing is consuming on peak there's, performance. There's, so. uh, there, there's a lot of demand on the base electrical system at that point. Uh, that that puts a major strain on the battery and the, yes. and the alternator and, and other components and. Uh, of course, uh, reinforcing why the electrical system needs to be in tip-top shape, and uh, we need to avoid running batteries dead in the shop uh, and make sure they're charged properly and maintained properly. But uh, what I also noticed, though, as I held it against full lock, it, it's wise enough, I guess smart enough, it's programmed to preserve itself, and it very quickly dropped off to about 60 and then down to about 50 amps as I kind of held it against full lock. Now, that's not a good exercise to do on a regular basis. You shouldn't sit there and kind of like the hydraulic power steering. You'd hear the pump just straining and typically the hydraulic pump then would go into bypass mode where you had it at full there, lock. Yes, there is a bypass inside the hydraulics to blow off that, yep. what is it, two and a half thousand PSI, that's a lot of pressure there right there yeah. and it needs to be blown off otherwise it, it, it just it creates a lot of heat and the Teflon rings inside the power steering. So door. something else I did while I had the scan tool hooked up and again this is kind of very informal but I got out there and I, I, I then leaned on the tire really hard without having anybody on the steering wheel. 
and it was interesting. I could watch the amperage pick up a little bit on that motor because it, it wants to, it's resisting what I'm doing. And I think about what these systems are doing as we drive down the road now and the wind's blowing across the highway, yet I don't get blown around as much. Mm -hmm. and, and I start to appreciate the fact that that rack is very actively doing something behind the scenes that I don't even think about. But it, it's doing it so fast that you can even not recognize so it. So I want to come back to the collision scenario where we're going down the road and blam, we get in an accident. All that force that went into that tire and wheel that gets transferred through the bearing into the spindle, into the knuckle, into the steering arm, into the tie rod end, into the rack, mm -hmm. inside of that rack, what's happening? Well, on many models, like uh, Scott described, there is a gates clutch mounted inside the rack. And between the electrical motor and the mechanical rack is a rubber coupler. Uh, and uh, that rubber coupler is actually, actually a safety system that if that electrical motor seizes, since we have a direct connection, which is by law mandatory, right, so it's obligated, so we can still steer. Okay. But if that electrical motor seizes up, all of a sudden my steering wheel locks up. Yeah. So we're going down the road, 65 miles an hour, I want to take the exit, turn my steering wheel, electrical motor says bye bye, I'm done working for you, I seize up. Now you got a problem, my steering wheel locks up. So they did tests on human beings and nobody pulled their hair and said, oh, I'm going to die. It's human nature, human tendency to grab the steering wheel, yank on the steering wheel in the direction that your brain says that's where we need to go. So you become a little bit of a superman and you become strong and you rip on the steering wheel and rip the splines of that rubber coupler, decoupling the electromotor from the rack. Now, if you're going to retroverse that or, 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 or that, ver ener that, scenario. That, that, uh, that energy, that energy that, that we put in when that electromotor lock seizes up and now in the, from the collision side, we get a collision that energy is impacting inside our rack. It can do two things. It can micro crack that rubber coupler. Now we still have thread, or it can strip it. So in a collision center, car comes in with an electromechanical rack. They spray paint the car. They don't change the rack. They start the car. No power steering. No fault codes. Now you unbolt the electromotor. Take the electromotor off. Find that rubber coupler broken. You call the dealer with the VIN number. You go just at the rubber coupler and they give you the whole rack for free with that rubber coupler. It comes as one assembly. They do not sell you this. Right. So, but it's, I it's understand, a it's li right. liability, yeah, right? You're gonna fumble that, well, that little you don't, piece. You in. don't know what else potentially in there. I've had a few of these apart, and they've got the belt in there that goes around the, the other gears that mm -hmm. go around the, uh, the, I'm gonna call it the bearing screw drive that traverses the rack back and forth. Exactly. And so you don't really know what else potentially is compromised inside of there. Yes. And you know, if, really if that rubber coupler, I would, I, would not, I would not let my wife drive just with a rubber coupler in. I would put a new rack in just for liability and safety reasons and, 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 and still keep my wife, right? But everything you're so, talking about here is a, a prime example of why you always reference vehicle maker service information because they may tell you if you've had impact with this rack, it's time to replace exactly. it. Yeah, we don't know that, you know that that's what every manufacturer is going to say, but you need to look at that stuff. Definitely, when a car with an electromechanical rack comes into your collision shop and, and had that collision on the front end, definitely do your homework on the car ma manufacturer's recommendations and specifications. So the other day, just uh, we were talking a little bit, and you mentioned that adaptations, and you've got a different scan tool. Well, I there. still have a little short story to finish okay. up on, on the rubber coupler, right? Okay. So we got the, the rubber coupler stripping is actually a good scenario. That's a yep. positive scenario. Yep. Okay, if we have a rubber coupler that got damaged, and now it has micro cracks, we patch up the vehicle, spray paint it, give the keys back to grandma, let grandma drive the car. Now grandma is putting force through the electromotor on the rubber coupler. Now during a drive cycle, those splines strip. Grandma loses control of the vehicle. Who's liable? Okay, so definitely take that into consideration when you have a vehicle with an electromechanical rack. Perfect. Back to adaptations. Before you jump into adaptations, let me do one thing because I forgot at the beginning. If anybody watching has any questions, please enter your questions into the chat. And when Neil's done with this next piece of the conversation, we will answer any questions out there. 
I think right. we have a question already, back right? Yeah, go ahead and go back into your story and we'll get into the questions uh, when you're done. Okay, okay, so um, we're gonna go over to this camera and this screen because I would like to explain adaptations. So Josh, can you, st can you start the car? That was what I was afraid of. So this is a very dynamic life situation. So we have a dead battery in our vehicle. Thank well, you. it's not completely dead. It's just a little bit on the low side. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're gonna skip that part. Now well, I can still talk about adaptation. So if we could take this screen here on the, on the pad, on the iPad, and I'm not getting live data in because it's not connecting with the vehicle. I probably, the battery percentage the battery voltage is so low that it's not talking to my, my uh, iPad here. So maybe what we'll do is we'll go ahead and answer some questions. We'll let Josh get a jumper pack on this vehicle right. so that we can get back to it. All right. Let's so this is a this is a good one because we, we all know the answer here, but you know, we were talking about it again yesterday. And the question is, would the driver feel anything strange at the steering wheel when there's too much resistance in a ball joint? Very good question. I really like this question. Okay, let's go back to power steering. Would, would a driver feel that with a power steering? Probably not. Hy electro even, hydraulic even, power if not even a hydraulic, you probably would. Hydraulic, feel that. no. So many ball joints out there, aftermarket ball, ball joints, heavy duty ball joints, they're very stiff. They need to have a break in period. Some yeah. they get a memory steer and then they get looser and then they get tighter again. So let's say 75, 80% of the time, no, sometimes, yes. It would have to be pretty significant. significant yes, the, you yeah. got some, I Another heard some sto some war stories and, and, and with, with high lifts and stuff like that and then yeah. heavy duty ball joints, but the regular OE kind of material, let's say no, okay? Uh, electronic power steering, electromotor, 80 Newton meters, 135 amps. You think uh, we're gonna feel something there? No. I don't think so. I think that the reality is with that electronic steering, you lose a lot of the feel to the steering wheel that you're, you're used to. So some of the, the things the you used to be systems, able to feel, you, just you may not. But think about this. We are not feeling it, but the sensor, the torque sensor inside is able to feel that. Right. And when it sees 70 turns to the left at 30 degrees, 70 turns to the right at 30 degrees. So he's talking about motor turns. Then, then the 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 the, 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 well, the, the steering the, the load on the motor and this right. torque sensor that is flex and if there's a difference in flex because all of a sudden I have a stiffer ball joint on one side of the vehicle than the so other if the one. the motor's drawing more amperage doing one direction than the other. And then, bing, the light goes on. But it's gonna say I got a problem inside me. I'm not gonna say I got a ball joint with too much resistance outside. It only wants to see am I physically safe and able to operate in the benefit of the driver. Yeah. So uh, hopefully yeah. that answers your question. Yep, so now we, we have another question here that says, how can an estimator make the decision if a steering rack after an accident has to be replaced? I feel like it's new complicated technology and the, the answer to that is, well, yes, it's new and complicated technology, but uh, again, start with going to the vehicle maker service yes. information and say, what does the vehicle maker say? Absolutely. In some cases, the vehicle maker may say, if you've had impact to the wheel or anything in, in the suspension steering, you need to replace the rack. In other cases, you may not. You need to do some of the diagnostic work that uh, hopefully you're going to be able to show here as soon as uh, Josh gets that jumper pack on there and he can yep. uh, start the vehicle and give you what you need. Well, and I think, you know, one of the things that... Uh, the vehicle makers do, they come out with the position statements, but that's still only drawing your attention to the service information. So even if they don't have a position statement out there, if you start going through that diagnostic flow chart for whatever the problem is, a lot of times it'll lead you down that path of what you actually need to diagnose and replace. So it's not always, oh, there's a little bit of damage here, I just have to replace it because that's what they say. Sometimes you're going to have to go through that diagnostic process to get there. Um, and we can't just throw parts at it because that doesn't work for the mechanical world. It certainly won't work in the collision world right. either. Is right. this information that you have on RTS on, on the, the racks? Um, with the position statements, yes. Um, sometimes, and I think we have uh, a series of articles that we're talking about doing on this exact subject because um, it does come up enough. But, uh, you know, that service information, we're going to help point it out to make you aware of it. 
but you need to dive into the service information for that step-by-step -step diagnostic procedure. Yep. All right. Good to know. Ooh, I think this might questions. be somebody giving us a hard time based on what we just had happen here in the studio, but it says, uh, should you put a <laughs> yeah, battery maintainer on a modern vehicle when you make diagnostic work? <laughs> Or is there a reason why? So, so, so I'll fess up here really <laughs> quick, okay? That vehicle had an AGM battery in it, and um, I'm guilty. I overcharged it and smoked it a few months ago. And it has a different battery that we borrowed out of a different vehicle, and uh, it's not in such great shape either after the f minus five degree night we had last but night. But the answer so. to your question is, <laughs> yes, you yes, should have a yes, battery maintainer on while you're doing diagnostic <laughs> <work>. <laughs> Yep, you caught us there. So, so I think we've got the vehicle fired up over there, and Neil, you yeah, should be able the, to, the lab, he's still so trying to connect. Where do we push now? What's, what's uh, because, uh, let's see, stop, start. So, interesting. Let's so what other articles do we have? I know you had a couple more that are on the, the RTS site. Let's take a look at those while uh, Neil's getting connected on that. Yeah, so, you know, to the question that where he said it's new and complicated, um, you know, the nice, the foundation is still there, but then all these different sensors and things like that, different inputs that we can monitor. Um, you really start looking at, you know, how it affects some of the ADAS systems, because now you have that steering angle sensor that's tied into front radar and cameras and all those different components need to work together. So even one degree off in a steering and suspension system, it can affect not only the steering itself, but also all the ADAS systems as well. Um, you know, and you have different things. Uh, we have this article on fuel economy, and the vehicle is adjusting the drivability, the ride height, all kinds of things that it's all calculating in. And if your basic structure isn't correct, or if um, you know there's a part that's not working correctly, it's going to affect all kinds of different performances that the customer may feel or notice. Um, but you kind of lost the road feel with a lot of these systems. You don't have that. The, the same connection like we talked about before. So yeah. it makes it really interesting when you start looking at these systems, just how many little nuances they actually control. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. You bring the, the ADAS conversation into this. And we've had ADAS uh, conversations before where we talk about the fact that, you know, these systems, while they're very intelligent systems, they're also, they're not very smart. They don't know that the vehicle is wrong and that we've got something that's calibrated wrong, it assumes that all the data that we've fed to that vehicle that says, here's where the steering angle sensor is you know, centered and here's where all these things are working and set up, it assumes that we've got everything correct. Yep. So you know, these systems, while they're smart systems, they're not smart enough to recognize that we've done something wrong yep. in the, you know, the repair of this vehicle and the system is now not gonna perform as designed. Yep. So, we yeah. have to be careful. Well, and, and that goes back to the structure conversation. There's no sensor on there that tells it where it is three-dimensionally in the world. It's only looking at, okay, this component moves this way with this much tension, and so it's, it's doing all these different measurements. So the sensors, the computers are smart, but they can't sense everything. Right. And I, I think that's, uh, you know, maybe someday there'll be a sensor with a brain box that says, okay, I'm here on the vehicle and everything is there, but we're a long way away from yeah. having something like that. For sure. Um, so we've got another question, and it says, uh, 80 amp motor is a lot. Does this mean that every time I turn the steering wheel, 80 amps gets drawn from the battery? Well, that's a very good question. Well, a little correction there. It is a 125 to 135 amps. It's 80 Newton meters on average, okay? I'm not a foot pounder guy, but that's, that's a lot of force that that electrical motor is helping us in power assistance. And that 125 to 135 amps, that is drawn from the alternator. So the battery is just a little support in between to start the car, but the alternator needs to be strong enough. But yes, it is supplying that amperage consistently if you need that power steering and that electrical motor needs to work that hard. So good okay. question. So, so, so as I was actually just turning the steering wheel back and forth in that vehicle, mm -hmm. I, I would see it at 25 and 35 amps, just normal friction sitting still. So rolling down the road, that would vary uh, quite a bit. Yes, so, so, so your vehicle really speed depends, your depends, depends tremendously. Right. If you're standing still, you got a lot of friction. If you're going sure. 60, the electromechanical power yep. steering says, you're going fast enough, I don't need to help you today. 
right. only in, yep. in assistance of direction, like you said, corrections. If we have outside elements yep. blowing on the vehicles and the chassis and changing the driving directions from the, and, and, and then the steering angle says, hey, steering torque sensor, did this come from the driver? Right. And the steering torque sensor says, no, it came from outside. Oh, I need to correct and keep the car in this drive direction. That happens within 50 milliseconds. Yep. Okay. Our human being perception threshold is 300 milliseconds and above. So we're all a little bit slow up here. I'll be. Uh, so it happens under under a perception threshold. I'll be curious to monitor that data pit so sitting in the passenger seat while we're driving down the road with the lane keep assist yeah. on. And see. So I know you're connected again. Let's go ahead yes. and get back to that. So all right. Can... So can we get the tablet screen so we can talk a little bit about that, please? Thank you, there we are. So on the top here, we see battery, vo battery, battery voltage. We just learned how, mu how important battery voltage is, and we can also see that the alternator is working because normally a good, healthy battery is about 12.6 volts, and everything above that is what the alternator, uh, alternator is feeding the battery. Steering wheel torque. So there's a torque sensor sitting on a torsion shaft. It's actually a magnet across from a hull sensor. And by the flex of that torsion shaft, we can register how much muscle you are putting in that shaft. And that is calculated inside a computer and converted into Newton meters. Now, here we got steering angle sensor on the third row. And I opened up my cell phone here. And hopefully, we can zoom in here on my cell phone a little bit is we got a compass, all right? So a steering angle sensor works exactly like a compass, telling the computer the driving, the chosen driving direction from the driver. So zero straight forward, quarter turn to the, to the right, plus 90 degrees, quarter turn to the left, minus 90 degrees. So in degrees, the car is calculating and fed into the computer the driving direction. Now the fourth line here, we see calibrated steering angle sensor offset. Wow, that's a head scratcher. Another terminology for that is long-term algorithm. When I first heard that word long-term algorithm, it's like, whoa, what is this? But this is the cap 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 capability, ooh, that was, a, that was a tongue tripper, the capability of the computer to adapt to situations just like long fuel trims, short fuel trims, and transmission adaptations. So it's a very dynamic system that can adapt to outside variable influences. If So as suspension parts wear just a little bit. Suspension parts wear a little bit, grandpa hits the shoulder of the curve, bends a rod, now his steering wheel is off, 1.5 degrees the car is gonna compensate through the electrical motor to keep that steering wheel straight. And you're gonna see those values increase or decrease to, depending on if the steering wheel is compensated to the left side or the right side. So like we have on our hydraulic power steering, we could counter steer and push a little bit because we are out of alignment. Now the computer is gonna compensate for you and we don't have that feeling. So you can actually see through these values, is the car out of alignment, is it not straight, and has the electromechanical power steering been compensating for that? So now, where this could be helpful then is a customer comes in, they've got tire wear, they're not feeling anything in the steering, you, you know, you've driven the vehicle, you didn't think there was a problem, but they have tire wear. This, this could be an explanation. This is this. a tremendous valuable diagnostic parameter for you to look in once you know what this is and what kind of numbers you need to look at. Now, always look at the car manufacturer specifications, but the rule of thumb here is about minus two and a half degrees to plus two and a half degrees before it sets a fault code and says, I'm walking out of my parameters. This is too much for me to compensate. But under these values, it will just regulate and compensate for something that is wrong. Great, great. All right, um, we're at the point now where I think we've gone through everything we were gonna talk about here today. Do we have any other questions? I see there's one question here, but I think Scott and I entered this in the conversation earlier, but I can ask Jeff and, and Neil if you guys wanna add anything here. Can you the guys explain is, the influence of this type of steering systems to ADAS? To ADAS. So the, the most immediate tie-in in my mind is where you've got the lane keep assist where you now have that windshield mounted camera that's doing the uh, lane marker recognition and it's electronically commanding, sending, sending commands over the CAN bus to the electronic steering rack to say, hey, turn left or turn right. 
or whatever it is to maintain position in lane. Well, the electromechanical power steering is the ticket to autonomous driving. Without the electromechanical power steering and what we can command and the computer can command this electrical motor with all the parameters that are coming in through LiDAR, radar and a camera, this vehicle can drive itself and, and that's going to be, I think, the future. So the electromechanical power steering and ADOS are going hand in hand. Great. So the next question we have is, seeing the live data, how could you determine a problem if was inside the steering rack or outside of the rack? Ah, that is not available. So now we still need to have a technician, a person who has technical knowledge and common sense, like Jeff prescribed, to disconnect the rack and feel, is there a heavy pivot point somewhere in my suspension and my chassis components that could bind up? The cool thing is we have the left side of the vehicle, we have the right side of the vehicle. So we have reference. Interesting. So with the, the torque center you're, you're talking about going one way or the other, uh, we talked about how if there was potentially a, a ball joint that was bad on one side, it could compensate because it was recognizing that you're having to apply more pressure one way or the other. Well, first of all, we start with a visual inspection, right? Comparing, hey, is there a newer ball joint on the left side versus the right? Or then is there damage? Is there damage? Comparing, are these the same colors? Does it have the same booth or the bellow? Yeah, is, could, could there be somebody been in here and changed something and that would be a self-inflicted wound like I prescribed earlier? And then, of course, see uh, disconnect the power steering and really turn the so steering wheel. So tie rod wheels. ends and something as simple as, I'm going to go back to the old fishing scale that gave you that, that, gave you that visual of oh, how much yeah. force am I applying to this tie rod end to move that knuckle assembly, there pivot you. it around the pivot axis yes. of the upper and lower ball joints or upper strut mount and the lower ball joint. And well, this do a is comparative from left to right. So this is the the, the, the laptop, the, the the iPad. This is new modern diagnostics, but we still need old school knowledge so about the me about the mechanical components yeah. and just how yeah. does it feel. And always compare left side to right side. That's 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 the best way to start your diagnostics physically. All right. Well, great information, guys. Uh, at this point, we're going to go ahead and wrap this up. If anybody has any additional questions that we didn't answer today or that you didn't get to us, uh, if, if you would like to submit your questions, you can submit them through repairersrealm at i-car.com. Uh, so again, if you have any questions or suggestions for a future Repairs Realm uh, segment that you'd like us to, uh, to dive into and, and have conversation about and show some demonstrations with our vehicles and the things we have here in the shop, uh, again, submit them to the same email address, and again, that's repairsrealm at i-car.com. And if you have any interesting uh, technical challenges or uh, stories you'd like to share with us, let us know. Yep, send it to the same email address. Or stuff right. that you can fix. <laughs> Sharing is caring. All right, have a good day, everybody.